Bishop Jakes, um, to have you with Hillsong East Coast is, uh, it's an honor. Um, you know, I love you dearly. Every time I see you, I probably say that too forcefully. Uh, well, but over the years, I've uh, obviously am one of the millions of people who would love you from afar. And I've had the privilege of being able to get to know you uh, on a couple different levels, one of which... Um, and this is kind of like a humble brag, but I don't care. You know, it's not every day I get to have you in the lilac, by the way, just looking like a million <laughs> bucks. The bishop drip is in full effect. I want um, to change to my camouflage. <laughs> you know, the, the lilac's better. Um, you invited me and a couple other, at that time, much younger pastors to your house to have like two or three days of just hearing you talk and just hanging out and you just giving us wisdom, which in and of itself just doesn't happen. I don't know if people know that about you. As, for as famous as you are, you are a down-home, one-on-one, like you just, you love people. So you had a bunch of us come over and uh, it must have been 11 some years ago, but that's when I found out this, this guy is more than, uh, you know, what the world might know him as, this big preacher. He just, he loves people. And it was a great weekend, but my favorite part was I was in your house, couldn't really sleep, and so I got up to go get some food, and I bumped into you in your robe in front of your fridge, and you go, what are you doing? I go, I was looking for some ice cream, and you go, me too, and you gave me some ice cream. I took some ice cream, and we just kind of walked away and never talked about it. That's when we first met. That was early on. I thought, man, if he still loves me after he catches me stealing ice cream from his actual <laughs> refrigerator, um, we're going to be friends for life. Well, the reason I gave you the ice cream is back then you had real long hair and I thought you were Jesus. That's what I should have stuck with. I should have kept you guessing. <laughs> um, you are, you're amazing. Thank you for this. And I, I was telling our church that how this came about was me just trying to think about what to do on a weekend like this. And, you know, from time to time I have texted you just to, I don't know, just try to get some sort of bearing on what to do at times. And we got to talking and you graciously uh, agreed to let us basically have our conversation with our Hillsong East Coast world. And I think it's, it's a time right now, as, as we're having this interview, there is a, uh, there's a march going on outside, Black Lives Matter. There is uh, a city in flames. There is right. unrest everywhere. And, and my question for you when I talk, I, I feel like, you know, racism, is a, it, it strikes at the heart of who we are as Christians. And I know my heart is in distress. I can't imagine what yours is like. And I just think it's such a, a supernatural thing to be able to have you speak on what you see right now, what you feel right now. Um, what, are you, what are you thinking? What are you seeing? I mean, do you think this pandemic is laced to this huge moment in culture where it seems like everybody is just looking around going, I don't know what we're going to do next, but something has to give. Yeah, I think uh, it's a perfect storm between the pandemic, uh, the economic crisis that we're having in the country, the stress of the times we're in. And you have to realize as African-Americans, when we finally came out of the house from staying in, uh, sheltering at, in home, at, at home, uh, we came in to walk into three consecutive uh, murders over the last 10 days uh, of people that were, uh, that did not for any practical purpose deserve to be, to be killed. Uh, that's a, a pretty harsh coming out party for people who have been in isolation and shut down uh, on top of uh, the disproportionate rate of African-Americans dying to the pandemic and the grief and the struggle of now 100,000 people dead, New York being hit extremely hard, uh, all races, all colors, all kinds, but uh, a higher proportion, disproportionately people of color. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a very stressful time. Notwithstanding, this is not a new problem and it's not a result of the pandemic. It's a result of a, of a spiritual pandemic and a cultural pandemic that has existed in America from the very foundations. And we've never really dealt with it. We mm -hmm. don't talk about it. Uh, it's taboo to discuss it. And most Christians feel like unity must be achieved by silence. 
So, uh, you know, if you bring up anything that's not palatable, uh, you're either called race baiting or we have some other name to disassociate ourselves from dealing with the realities uh, that that we don't have to be colorblind and God is not colorblind, that he intentionally painted me this color and you that color and the Asians their color and he doesn't have to go blind to love us and, and we shouldn't have to go blind uh, to be loved. We should be able to be loved in the skin you're in. And uh, we have not mastered that as a church. So whenever this kind of situation occurs, we can't take the leadership role that we ought to take because I know your church is not that way and my church is not fully that way. We have some integration in our churches, but by and large, 11 o'clock, hour on Sunday morning, as Dr. King said, is still a very segregated hour. Hmm. I, I'm going to, I want to read you some names here, and I just want you to tell me what you think when you hear the, these names. Uh, Trayvon Martin, John Crowder, Michael Brown Jr., Dante Parker, Tanisha Anderson, Tamir Rice, Jerome Reed, Eric Gardner, Philip White, Eric Harris, Walter Scott, Freddie Gray, Betty Jones, Cornelius Brown, Jamar Clark, Alonzo Smith, Tyree Crawford, Felix Kumi, Christian Taylor, Oscar Grant, Sandra Bland, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd. At least six of those names, I know their families. I interviewed their mothers. Uh, one of them, I attended the funeral. So I'm well acquainted with the situations and the stories. Uh, my heart sinks in my chest when I hear those names. Um, because I know that we love our children like everybody else loves their children. There's no difference there. And um, uh, when you start looking at the amount of devastation that has occurred to us as a people, it's very difficult to articulate to people from other historical backgrounds the magnitude of the suffering. Let me say this, this, this might help to be enlightened. Not too long ago, a group of psychologists did a test on uh, the grandchildren of, of uh, people who had endured the Holocaust. And they found out that the amount of the stress that their grandparents had suffered during the Holocaust was so overwhelming that it had rearranged the DNA structure of their physiological body. Hmm. When, the, when, that, when that test was done, it elicited some initial test into African Americans. And similarly, uh, the stress over the years has, has had an effect physiologically, emotionally, socially, attitudinally. Uh, and we've never really dealt with that. We've never really gotten down to the bottom of that. And even we ourselves as a people don't fully understand the magnitude of the pressure because uh, that anxiety, that trauma has become our normal. Mm -hmm. And anytime trauma becomes your normal, you have coping mechanisms whereby you uh, survive by coping. But every time somebody does something like what you just named off of those list of people who were lost, mm -hmm. those are triggers. And when those triggers go off, that trauma comes back. And the anger that you see is not about one incident alone, right. but it's about the multiplicity of many incidents. It's about, for example, myself. It's about my grandfather, who I'm named after, who was murdered by white racists in Mississippi while my grandmother was pregnant and 22 years old. Uh, he was murdered in barbed wire in a, in a lake, and she was cooking dinner and the first T.D. Jakes never made it home. Um, he, he was murdered on June the 9th. Uh, by coincidence, I was born on June the 9th. Uh, wow. I am named after him. So that's very, very real. I never saw my grandfather. I never met him. Uh, and I'm named after him. And the only thing I know about him is that he was murdered. Uh, so th these stories are typical. Our families are scattered. Some of my relatives I don't know because they ran away from the South and never their families never saw them again, trying to escape the atrocities of our history. And most of the time when mainstream America looks at that, they like to think that was a long time ago. Right. Well, no, 
it wasn't a long time ago. That right. was my grandfather. And so I grew up in the 60s. I'm 62. I know I look 40, but I'm you 62. Look, you look fantastic, Bishop. You know that, right. though. You know that. You oh, can oh, see oh, it oh, through oh, the screen. Oh, oh. Yeah, I feel it. I feel it. Uh, but I remember my father going to the backs of the restaurants to get food at the back door because we couldn't eat on the inside. Right. I remember vividly the colored water fountains in the third bathrooms. Uh, uh, I remember Rosa Parks vividly. I had pictures of she and I together. Wow. Uh, history isn't as far back as we'd like to throw it, but we have short memories about this sort of thing. Mm. I think that the church has a responsibility, an obligation, and a calling to respond to it. But here's the problem with that. Can I be candid? Sir. Uh, I was in uh, Ghana, in Accra, in Ghana, at the Spanish castles called El Mina. You can Google it. Uh, it's where the slaves were waiting to be taken to America. Mm. I toured the dungeons where they were stacked like sardines. Uh, not like even like people not standing stacked, uh, where they defecated and urinated on top of each other until it dripped down from body to body down into a trough and was washed out. The smell of their body fluids is still in the castle. Uh, if you don't believe it, go there. All the wind from the ocean, it's right by the ocean, has not been able to blow away the stench of the slaves. I stuck my fingernails. I have video footage of me sticking my fingernails in the scratch marks of the slaves scratching through concrete, uh, trying not to go uh, away from their home and 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 their country and 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 their place. There was a there was a grate at the at the on the main floor of the Almina castles where the women were hosed off so that the slave masters could rape them for their entertainment while they waited on the ships to come. And then off to my right is a church sitting on top of all of that. So the people who were raping those women, castrating those men, uh, leading the slave trade were also worshiping and singing hymns above where the slaves were beneath the ship. The church has a very difficult history when it comes to racial issues. It goes back hundreds of years. Uh, we have been complicit. We have been participants. And now we have just been silent. And I don't know which one is worse, to be participant, to be complicit, or to be silent. Both of them are traumatic, and I'll tell you why. Mm. Uh, I've spent most of my life working with children who have been uh, with adults who have survived child abuse. And generally, as horrific as the child abuse is, uh, many times the child is not any more angry at the abuser than they are at the parent who kept silent who looked the other way, who minimized their pain, who told them to be quiet and be silent. Uh, child abuse is much like, like slavery and like Jim Crow. It's when one person who's in a position of power takes advantage of another person who's not. And so all of the trauma that you would expect to see in a child who has been abused, you see that level of trauma in a race of people who have been dominated, desecrated, uh, raped, and ostracized. Mm. I know this is difficult for your congregation to hear. We need to hear. And it's difficult, but it's difficult to, to even say it, but it is, it is true nonetheless. And we have uh, worked hard at, at being quiet. And from a theological perspective, it makes me think of what Jesus said. Mm. Let's be preachers for a minute. Go ahead. Okay. I, I, I don't um, like to be like we're not preachers. Like you're a you're you, my favorite. Maybe one of the best. You know, walking. Go ahead, sir. Preach. Stop. When uh, when the lawyers tried to trap Jesus in, in in the law that he had made, he said uh, the commandments were that you love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy mind, and soul, and that you love your neighbor as yourself. And the lawyer willing to trip Jesus up said, who is my neighbor? Because he wanted to pick who he loved. And uh, that's when Jesus, that's what elicited the story of the Good Samaritan. And Jesus says, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell amongst thieves. They stripped him 
and wounded him and left him half dead. As Jesus goes on to tell the parable, he says, uh, a priest came by and looked at the man stripped, bleeding, and half dead, and turned his head and walked away. And then the Levite came and he walked over there where he was. He saw it, he turned his head, he walked away. And then Jesus says, the good Samaritan came and he came where he was and got down off his beast and poured in the oil and the wine. And we always preach about the good Samaritan, but we don't preach about the two people who came and looked away. But what we really need to look at is the church has a tendency to look away from the stripping, the wounded and the half dead, Mm. the disenfranchised, not just black people, not just brown people, uh, poor people, uh, people in cages uh, on the border, anything that gets ugly that we don't want to deal with, we look away. We look away like mothers look away when stepfathers rape daughters. Our silence is abuse. And that's why I admire you. And that's why I wanted to be here talking to you today. Because you did not come and look at our bleeding and walk away. But you had the courage and the boldness to speak up and speak out and face the ridicule of other people. You refused to be like the first two who incidentally were religious people, Levites and priests, uh, handling the law and the scriptures but still not willing to deal with the person for whom the scriptures was written. You made a difference because you opened your mouth to speak. And every time you open your mouth to speak, it acknowledges and legitimizes the fact that I have a right to bleed. That I have a right to bleed. That, that, that those families have a right to bleed. That those mothers have a right to bleed that those children who lost their father have a right to bleed that those brothers, one of which I got off the phone with today, has a right to bleed. And uh, as for the marching, I I don't think that violence is the answer. Hmm. Uh, History has taught us that violence is not the cure. Hmm. But as Dr. King said, who led a nonviolent movement, uh, it is not the atrocities, and I'll paraphrase it, nor the wickedness of evil men that is the most appalling. It is, in fact, the silence of good men. Mm-hmm. When the men, when good men are silent, and there are good men, white, black, and brown, and there are good people listening at me in this church today, and there are good people who love Jesus and love other people and do not approve of the atrocities, but their silence is abuse. If, if, if good people would speak up, then those kids wouldn't be up there burning up buildings. But they're desperate. They're desperate like an abused child. They're desperate like the screams of women who have cried out in this country against sexual abuse and were not believed for years and years. And whenever they had got the courage to say something, they did to them what they do to us. They would bring up anything in their past to justify them and they would shame the victim into silence until one day women said, I'm not taking it anymore. And they rose up in power. And finally, after years and years and years of having to tuck their heads between their legs and walk away, even though they were the victim, they finally began to put the perpetrators in jail. What God has done in this country for women is what people of color are asking for, for somebody to to acknowledge that we are bleeding, that we that we work and clean in your hospitals, that we would deliver your food to you that we died at disproportionate rate because we live in repressed areas for the most part with too many people congregating in areas that are uh, subordinate, uh, living in the hood with food deserts where there are no decent grocery stores, Mm -hmm. where every greasy chicken place imaginable targets our community, liquor stores target our community, 
payday loans target our community. And, and America says, this is the land of, of the free and the home of the brave. And anything is possible in America. Mm. Anything is possible if my legs are not broken. But if you break my legs, then it's impossible for me to stand up. And I come to you today not to make anybody feel bad or guilty, but to explain the, what for some people has never been explained by somebody who wasn't calm, who was calm and who wasn't angry and who wasn't accusatory. And I'm not blaming anybody by the color of their skin. I'm explaining the rage and the forlorn that you can only keep a victim quiet so long and then they start to scream out. And uh, I, my appeal is, is not for black people to galvanize and march but for black, white, red, brown, mixed race people to scream out against these atrocities because mm -hmm. if, it is, if it is my child today, it could be yours tomorrow. I think, uh, I don't know what to say sometimes, you know, when, when, when you're speaking these kind of facts from your perspective, I think, it, it, it should be uncomfortable. It should be hard to hear. And I think we have a church, and hopefully we represent a lot of churches that are uh, desperate to no longer be silent, to be complicit. And, you know, it's interesting to me, Bishop, with, with uh, George, who just died, I've talked to some of my friends who are not white, and the overriding sentiment is, because we've seen this before, like I, I got, I, I couldn't even get to the names. Like I just read a couple, we, we've seen this before. And I think the difference is a little bit of visibility, but one of my friends just in tears, and he's a big guy, he just said he, he, he killed him. You know, he put his, 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 uh, ne his, his knee in his neck and he killed him. And he just said, what, what does somebody expect me to do? And, and I think one of my frustrations, Bishop, and you can help me here, you can just get personal and help me pastor better, but my frustration is we're talking about reaching the world and we have a really bad found. I feel like I'm good with the loss, but I look around at the found and I'm, I'm at a point now where I'm, I'm t I, can't, I can't do it anymore. I can't sit there and hear another person deflect or talk away or bring up another issue. To me, racism is such a no-brainer affront to the gospel that we shouldn't, we shouldn't be where we are. Our culture should look like it looks. And I'm to the point now where I'm going, you know what, if this is the hill we got to die on, sign me up. Because if we don't get this right, who are we kidding? What world are we going to reach? If even in the church, we've got some people who still don't, don't talk about race. And you know, I can't imagine what you've heard over the years, but even my 10 year journey as the pastor of this church, you know, you're getting real political and it's not about race. It's not, and, and, I, and I go, at what point? Can we get people to peel back some of these defensive layers and start to hear again and start to listen again? I think you, even you doing this today is such an honor for us to have your voice because I know there's more people. And I tried to explain this to one of my, my black friends who refused to listen. To me. I said there are more rational, kind, open-minded, passionate you know, people than the opposite. And he said, I don't believe it. I don't see them. If, they, if that was true, we wouldn't be where we are. And it, and it convicted me to, my, to the core of who I am because I'm going, it's got to be time to show and prove. And, and maybe we're going to stay candid because the time of the church white gloves has been done. I think we have to start talking. So if, I, if you were to talk to somebody today, and I've, I've talked to people like this who say, well, I just don't believe that, you know, systematic racism is a thing. You know, I just, I just don't believe that, Carl. I believe it's a cop-out. What if that person is open today? What would you say to them? Because it's a huge deal. And there's people here who don't, they don't get it yet. And they don't get how deep, deeply layered these issues are. What would you say to See, that person? First of all, let me say this, that... Uh... You, you, you bring me before this auspicious body of believers as evidence to articulate the magnitude and the atrocities of the pain of the people who have lost their voice. And, and I am proof for you. 
But what you don't realize is that I come on this uh, format because you are proof for me. You are proof for me that, that there are good people who are not of color who will speak up and speak out and who really care. And the more we see that, the more the more we see that it uh it means everything it, it gives us a little bitty thing that you can't put on a scale and you can't add to an accounted sheet but what it does it gives us hope and uh, that that hope is a very powerful thing that that hope is a powerful thing that that dr king's dream might become a reality uh and and i see great hope amongst the younger generation i i see as I, I, i'm so excited uh, because you dance to the beat of another drum and because you have the courage uh to, to come where where we are the man who came to the to the bleeding man on the side of the road was not the same race. That was the point. He was a Samaritan. And in the Bible days, if you go to the woman at the well, you will realize that the first thing the woman at the well said to Jesus is that the Jews and the Samaritans don't deal with each other. And Jesus picked the Samaritan intentionally to drive home to the Jewish lawyer that you might be bleeding on the side of the road and it might be a Samaritan who has to pick you up and put you on his beast and carry you to the other side. But you've got to see him as your neighbor. Mm. That was, that's, that's the message. That's the beauty of the message. And, and it goes both ways. It goes both ways. It goes to black racism. It goes to white racism. It goes to all types of racism. Mm. And we all have our own proclivities and our tendencies uh, to stay within the comfort cubicles of the familiar. But God is calling the church out from the familiar into the exceptional, uh, into the uncertain, into the place where you're, you're not sure what to say or what to do, that's where faith is formalized. Not, not where you are sure and not where the facts are absolute, but where you're on dangerous territory, that's where faith gives birth. And, and people who play it safe and stay within the demographics of the familiar, be them black, white, or brown, they miss the beauty of the planet because the whole beauty of the planet is in its diversity. It's, it's in old men and young men sitting down together. It's in old women and young women talking and Democrats and Republicans talking and Baptists and Methodists talking and black folks and white folks talking and finding out there's more to unite us than there is to divide us. Mm. And, and that, that incident that occurred in Minneapolis that, 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 that happened to, to George Floyd, mm. it, it's not indicative of all police officers. I have police officers in my church, black and white, who are excellent people, who, who give their lives for little bits of money to protect us, who, who carry us out of burning buildings, who pull us out of car wrecks, who, mm. who do amazing heroic things. That, 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 but if we don't, if you don't, have any way of policing the police then too much power put into the hands of a person that is never questioned or judged when they misappropriate that power hmm. it, it 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 creates a a, a, a toxic uh cynical view of the whole system and you mentioned systematic racism and, and let me get back to your question systematic racism, the reason that, that the people that you talk to don't believe it is because they're not victimized by it. You, I, I, don't, I don't blame them for not believing it because, because the police in their neighborhood don't do that. <laughs> the, the, the police in their neighborhood do not do that. Right. The, the police who pull up to them are help for them and encouragement for them, and they are assumed to be good people. They are assumed and to proven otherwise that they're good people, even if they've had a couple of drinks. They're ju they just had too much to drink. Yeah. I'll make it plain. If, if you live in one part of Chicago and you got a drug problem, you go to jail. And if you live in another part of Chicago and you got a drug problem, it's a sickness and you go to rehab. Yeah. 
okay? So what is a crime in our community is a sickness in your community. Treatable with sympathy and empathy and kindness and it's talked about openly. And if I have the same problem and live in the wrong zip code, I'm a criminal and a dog and an outlaw. See, these kinds of inconsistencies have to be, you can't just preach grace and not truth. We beheld the wonder of his glory, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What made Jesus so amazing is that he balanced grace and truth. He did not compromise truth for grace. And what has to happen for us is it's that unbelief is because we live in the vacuums of our safety and we hear about what's going on other places through the news and we pick the news we listen to. Man. So when when you write the books you read, you always win in the end. <laughs> yes, sir. Does that make sense to you? It does make uh, sense to me. I hope somebody says amen out there. Uh, you got, uh, it, you it, got it, people it, it, hitting the screen right now. Trust me. You got people <laughs> punching the lilac on the screen. See, I appeal to the women for a minute. Because women come closer to understanding it because they have been oppressed too. Mm -hmm. And they have not been believed too. And they have been underpaid for the same job too. And they have been demeaned and ostracized and, and they know what it is to walk into a good old boys club room and feel the ice of you don't belong here. It's not said, it's felt. Systems, systems systems, toxic systems. It's, no, we're not wearing white sheets. No, we're not lighting crosses. No, uh, we're, we're not doing overt racism, but there are systemic things that are geared. It's, it's like my, my iPhone right here. My iPhone has a, a face recognition dimension on it. And it is a fact that the face recognition has trouble recognizing black faces because the guys who built them had white faces and they're had trouble recognizing my face. And just like my phone has trouble recognizing my face, so do opportunities. So I have to hold my face up and work twice as hard to get my phone to recognize me because it was not designed with me in mind. It was not designed with me and my, I, I bought it. I have the money. I paid for it. It's my phone, but it was not designed with me in, in mind. And it, the, it is not even a human and it doesn't always recognize me. And by Apple's own admission, they're trying to work with it for it to recognize other types of faces. When you design a world that fits your features, you don't have to be an evil person for, for what you design not to fit me not to fit how I learn or how I read or how I sing or how I dance or how I move or how I feel. And, and all of a sudden you become the standard to the point that without even saying it, you don't think that you're an ethnicity. You think that everybody different from you is an ethnicity. That means that you're an elite. Mm. Because the truth of the matter is there are more black and brown people in the world than there are white people. But the reality, in spite of the truth, is is that there are white people and then there are racists. There are all these different other races. Which means you become the benchmark and, and the standard bearer. And, and that is systemic racism. It's not hatred or malice, it is condoning the fact that my phone does not recognize my face. You know, I, uh, I love you so much. That's a sidebar. I just, I think you're... you're no, that's point. <laughs> no, I think your you're grace and your... Uh, I've just seen you, I've seen you in so many different settings. And, uh, you know, I've seen you preach to to largely white audiences. I've seen you preach to, I've been to the potter's house. You know, I've seen you at home. And, right. you know, you're, you're really good at, at trying to reach people where they're at without ever foregoing who you are. Um, but I think what, what you're hitting on here is the fact that, you know, we, we, have to, we have to enlarge our pool of information today. 
Like we, we, there are people right now who would be sitting at home and they would never have thought of some of this stuff because they've never been around to hear it. They've been no. surrounded. And I, and I, uh, we, got, we got a long way to go in the Lentz household, but I do know when it comes to racism, one of my slim pieces of encouragement is I can't control everybody, but I can control my, my kids. It's a dictatorship. Like I will teach you how to learn. And, and, and you know, over the years, I think it's worked. I think we were watching a movie over Christmas and after the first commercial, it was Home Alone. It said American classic. And my daughter said, Dad, why do they call a movie with no black people an American classic? They should call it a white classic. And I stood up, I shouted my daughter down. I said, you're exactly right. And, and she said, I brought something like that up in school, you know, and I think, you know, it causes trouble. And I think those two little moments for me reminded me that the information we're getting is vital and the trouble we're causing is necessary. And I, I think sometimes people are desperate to change, but they don't want to cause trouble. And they almost don't want to cause trouble even in their own soul. And I, I want that to happen. I want to be troubled. I want our churches to be troubled. I think that's a first, one of the first things I'm praying for is that people would just start to be troubled. I had a friend sat next to me the other night and I was showing him the video of, of what happened to um, my brother George Floyd. And he goes, I just have turned my brain off to this for too long. And I thought, you know, I just feel like this is different. I feel like this moment in history, I don't know if you think I'm right or wrong and uh, whatever you say I, I will agree with, but I feel like at what point does this stop becoming what we do? You know, tragedy fatigue is a real thing. There's some, I, I've got some of my black friends who are just numb. They're like, I got nothing. I got no tears. I got no love. I got no hope. It's going to happen again, and it's going to happen again. I think that God is going to put us on notice. I feel like that. I can't speak for other pastors, but I feel like if we can't get this right, because this isn't about race, it's about humanity. Like, if you're a Christian and you don't see this, like, this is what Jesus did. He walked around and destroyed destroyed every racial barrier he could find. He went out of his way to destroy it. But yet we are protecting some of these, even by our ignorance and by our silence. What, what do you think we can do practically? This is, this is important to me. I wanted to ask you this because I, I've got some other friends who, they, they're like, I'm done with the hashtags. Like, I don't want to see another dude throw up another post about how sad they are. And, and I get that. And luckily, I have some friends I could talk to and say, give us some grace. Give some people some grace. I know they're new to this game, but at least they're coming in now. Um, <laughs> what, what do we do? Uh, like, if, if you're a white family watching right now and you're going, you know what? We might have some racism embedded in us from generations. And they feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit and they go, no more. What can they do? What, what, what are practical things you can do to attack this at its core? Let me tell you what you can't do. We don't need another foot washing ceremony. My feet are clean. We don't, we're not trying to get you to come wash our feet. You know, we have had all of those ceremonies to the point, you know, that I feel like I got a manicure when I go to church. <laughs> we don't, funny. we don't, we don't need that. We, we, we don't. We don't even need you to feel guilty or shame for history that it wasn't you. That's not it's the important. point. Yeah. That's not the point. You you weren't the, the people that were singing above the slaves. And you can't help what your ancestors did no more than I can help what mine did. That's not that's not what I'm after. When you speak up and break the silence, when you stop allowing a black issue to be a black, black issue, issue and allow it to be an American issue. My issue. Yeah, it's my issue too. There is no way in the world that I could have seen somebody put their knee in your neck. What are we talking about? Not. There is no way in the world, I promise you, that I could stand by and watch somebody press their knee into your neck till you bled and died on the street and not come to you. And it has nothing to do with being white or black. It has everything to do with being human. And the only thing we're asking for is just 
human dignity. I, it, this isn't even about being washed in the blood. This is about being a human. This is about respect for human life. This is about uh, all souls are mine. That, that God so loved the world, not not God so loved the Christians or God so loved the Republicans or God so loved the white folks or God so loved, no, God so loved the world that, who's, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And if God could love me and God lives in you, then how can you say that he dwells in you and you could stand there and watch a grown man cry for his mama Hmm. handcuffed handcuffed face down you can't say this time I feared for my life Mm -mm. four police officers standing around doing absolutely nothing the man is handcuffed like a hog and you press your knee with your body weight into my neck till you crush me and I'm crying for my mother we should all be ashamed. We should, we, should, we should all be uncomfortable. We should all be horrified. It is atrocious. What you can do is, is, is it starts with speaking out and speaking to the elected officials and letting no, no longer letting it be said that the black community is upset. Right, right in my peripheral view, I can see the news above my screen, and and they've got all of these black people up here because they bring black people in when black people die, and black people talk about it like it's a black person's issue. That as long as we got that, we got a problem. It ought to be a human issue. I, I said, I sent all kinds of food to South America to feed uh, people in Venezuela. And I can't even speak Spanish, but they were hungry. Yeah. And I had some money. Yeah. And we sent food, all kinds of food to feed them. I dug wells in Kenya. Now I'm not I'm not Kenyan, but they didn't have any water. They were thirsty. We helped in in in, in after Katrina pulling black bodies and white bodies out of the flood, irrespective to who they were. They're just people. And I just, what you can do is love better. What you can do is speak up for God's sake. Say something, write somebody, protest, do whatever you can do with whatever you can do. And then on a, on a smaller level, social justice isn't just carrying signs and picketing. Though I have to say this, I have to say that in Charlottesville, it was such an amazing thing that none of the press said anything about that it wasn't just black folks marching in Charlottesville, it was white folks marching too. Our kids need to see you care about us. Yeah. Our kids need to see that we are human enough, even though the constitution that was written says that I was not fully human. I swallow that. Can you just That's mention, over. Those folks can, can are dead. You mention, can you mention that about the Constitution real quick, what you just said? Yes, the Constitution says that we were not fully human. I think it was one-fourth or two-thirds human. That's how they were able to feel comfortable with enslaving me because they didn't feel... They, they wrote into the Constitution of this country that I was not human. Now, look... The Constitution that protected you enslaved me. You know what the funniest holiday is for me? It's the 4th of July. I'll bet. Because when we have the 4th of July and the flags are waving and we're singing the Star Spangled Banner, it's not that I don't love this country. It's the only country I ever known. I absolutely love this country. It's just that I was not free in 1776. <laughs> July the 4th does not mean to me what it means to you. When you say you want to go back to the founding fathers, I don't want to go with you. Me neither. Because if we go back to the founding fathers, I wouldn't even be in the house. I would be in the field picking cotton. That's the bitter truth. You can tell the truth. You can just tell the truth in school, in class. You can tell the truth. Our, we, we had liberation and we have an Independence Day, but it wasn't the 4th of July. And we celebrate with you. We eat hot dogs and we, uh, we, we make apple pie and all of that. But the truth of the matter, 
independence was only for one group of people on the 4th of July. It was not for Native Americans. It was not for African Americans. But we celebrate with you. Then come celebrate with me. Come into my house like you did and eat my food and see my kids and see that I am human. And see that I love my kids like you love your kids and I want the best for them. Even if they fall short of it and they messed up, don't point your finger at my kids and say they had it coming. Those are the kinds of things that you can do. You can, you can, you can do more than have black people in your church. You can have black people in your life. Mm. Because I don't want to be a prop on a stage so you can brag to your friends that your church is progressive. Mm. I want to be your friend. I want to be your friend. I want to laugh at your jokes. I want to tell you my secrets. I want to, I want to be your friend. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to be fully vested. And these are realities that we do not come to grips with. And, and God knows, God knows, this is not the way I would like my first sermon to be or my first speaking at your church to be. I would much rather Well, you know what? Water. Hold on, hold on. I, I'm not that naive, Bishop, okay? 99.9% .9 of our church would probably come to our church and then go home and listen to the other pastor, you. So it's not like they, they don't know you, okay? There might be one guy who's brand new. Uh, is Bishop T.D. Jakes, okay, to that one guy. Everybody else, you, you, you are our church. We've been, we've been gleaning, we've been hearing, we've been taking the gift that you are for years. So, you know what? If this is the tone, if this is the tenor, then so be it. So be it. Because I know that I, I can speak as a, I don't, want to, I don't want to say too much here because I am a pastor under a pastor and you know my pastor. But I will say, I, I think that it needs to be said, we, we, we will enjoy the gift of a black preacher. We will enjoy the gift of black culture. Uh, but sometimes it stops there. And I feel yeah. like, you know, if people are watching and they will be all over our country. You know, it, it is time to do a reckoning. If you, if you are a part of a church that doesn't, steamroll at some of these issues. I'm not talking about dance around them. I'm not talking about having a moment of silence. I feel like this is, this isn't, it, it go, it, the race can be the, the bridge, but this is about humanity. If your church isn't talking about this, if it's not at a level of unrest at this, it says more. This isn't about race. This is about Jesus again. Everything Jesus fought for, that's our fight. Everything Jesus fought against, that's our fight. So I think there's a lot of churches because I have I had a list of questions for you that we'll never get to. Maybe uh, the next time I can almost hustle you <laughs> onto a Zoom call. I mean, that's why I was like, I felt so bad. I went from texting you to calling you to here you are on taking your valuable time to pour into us. But I feel like, you know, there, there has to be a, a, a shift. There has to be where people start holding themselves accountable holding some of this teaching accountable, we start asking ourselves, what are we doing? <laughs> Something's got to give. We have to do that. We, we, we must begin. If you belong to a political party that doesn't have a strategy that includes black America, get out. Say, it, say belong, it for the people in the back of their couch. <laughs> I used to yes, say it in the back of the room, yes. but it's a couch. If, 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 if they do not have an agenda that includes black America and brown America and all of America, then the fact that they have two or three points that you really care about and they don't have a global understanding of a diverse society, you don't want to be in that. Because Jesus, there's a reason that Joseph wore the coat of many colors. He's a type of Christ. And his father put him in a coat of many colors because he is a picture of Jesus Christ who was sold into slavery by his brothers and rose up and went into the prison and came out and became the prince of Egypt. That coat of many colors was the multiplicity of his ability to be Hebrew by blood and yet serve the Midianites and then become the prince of the Egyptians. Look at it. Everybody in the Bible that had the ability to be diverse in their perspectives did the greatest work. Whether wow. you're talking about Joseph or whether you're talking about Moses, who was Hebrew, but raised in the palace as an Egyptian, was mentored by the 
by, by Jethro the Midianite and then sent to the east, sent through the wilderness. He was diverse in his perspective. Or the Apostle Paul, who spoke in five different languages and had the ability both to abase and abound. Mm -hmm. And though he was a Hebrew of the highest order, he was also a citizen of Rome. And you have to understand that his ability to be multiplicitous is how God used him to go to Athens and stand on Mars Hill and to be able to preach the gospel to all kinds of people because they were not one-dimensional. And we cannot have churches that are one-dimensional and we cannot have pastors that are one-dimensional and we cannot have parties that are one-dimensional. And we have to reject that notion of a world that excludes people that Jesus died for. We have to do that. We have to do that. And we can do that. And, and we have to begin to understand that there are good black people and bad black people and there are crazy black people and there are good white people and there are crazy white people. I'm from West Virginia. There was only 5% black. I grew up around white people. I am a living witness. There are poor white people and there are crazy right. white people and there are fun white people. And every, every type of person in the world has diversity. You just want to be recognized by who you are and, and, and the character of your heart and not the color of your skin. And that is the beginning of a transformative church, a 21st century church, which is what you are doing, is building a 21st century church. And God bless you for the courage not to be the status quo. God bless you uh, for the licks that you've taken to make a difference in the world. God bless you for loving the people that the church often says you should not love. God bless you for throwing your arms around people and getting your into trouble because Jesus was Jesus because he got into trouble. Jesus was Jesus because he got into trouble. And the people who signed his death warrant were church people. The religious people hated Jesus. And if you're going to follow Jesus, religion hates relationship. Oh, wow. And you have a choice to either be a religious person or to have a relationship with God. And, and the challenge is is to have the kind of relationship with God that you love who he loves. My wife says this all the time. She says, if you shout want to know what to people... Shout out to the first lady who we love. Yeah, shout out to the first lady. <laughs> My wife says, if you want to know what people think about you, watch how their children treat, treat you. Well... It, because if, if, they've been if the parents have been talking about you in the house, the children are going to treat you funny. You, you know why? Because children love who their parents love. Mm. And if we are the children of God, then we ought to love who God loves. We ought, to, we ought to care when God cares, and we ought to fight when God fights for each other. Let me tell you something about 9-11. 9-11 showed America what America is because our enemies killed the black, the white, the brown, the millennials, the boomers, the Democrats, the Republicans, when those when those planes hit the World Trade Centers, they didn't ask you about political parties or how much money you had in the bank. They killed us all. When this virus hit this country, it killed us all. Why do we allow our enemy to understand something about us that we do not understand about ourselves? That we are one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That's what they taught me in school. And I still believe it. And the outrage, you have to understand, the outrage that you see in the streets is wrong. I condemn it. I'm against it. It right. should not be violent. It should not be destructive. It's counterproductive. But the outrage is really a reflection of the shock and disappointment because we believed you when you said liberty and justice for all. And we really believed that. We wouldn't be mad if we didn't believe it. We believed that that when the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, we believed we were free. Mm. We believed that. I'll tell, I'll tell you this, I won't keep you long, but I'll tell you hold this. On, my hold son on, let me stop you there. Me. You can't keep us long. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Is it okay? Oh, my, my God. My, 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 Are you kidding my son me? called me the other day. It was about 11.30. It might have been 12 o'clock at night. He called me. Which son? And I, my, my oldest son, Jamar. Okay. And he called me and he said, Daddy, he said, I'm in trouble. And my heart dropped. Oh my God. Right. Because when you call me that time of night and you say, Dad, and the conversation starts, Daddy, I'm in trouble, it's not going to be good. He said, Daddy, I'm in trouble. I said, What's wrong, son? And he said, I had a car wreck. He said, And it's real bad. 
he said, I think the, the car is totaled and, and I think the other guy might be hurt. He said, I, and, and, and he hit me. He said, it was not my fault. He was crying, he was crying, he was crying. He was crying, he was crying on the phone. And I said, are you okay? He said, yes, sir. He said, I think I'm okay. I think I'm fine. And I said, keep me on the phone. Keep me on the phone. You know why I said keep me on the phone? I was more scared of the police than I was of the car wreck. Hmm. I was scared to death. Hmm. Hmm. I was scared to death. And when I heard the policeman talk to him like he was a human being, I breathed a sigh of relief. I was scared to death. And I told my son, I said, don't say nothing. Don't move. Don't get upset. Don't go, don't drive away. Don't panic. Don't freak out. Don't do anything. Keep me on the phone. I was scared mm -hmm. to death mm -hmm. that I would be sitting beside Benjamin Crump today on CNN. Not of the wreck. I was scared of the police. And until you understand the reality of that feeling, mm. you 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 won't you you won't get the utter turmoil that we had, the kinds of conversations that we had with our children mm. that don't are work. Different by the than way, the that don't work can have all the combos yes. in the world, and you can't sit still enough. No, no, you can sit perfectly still. This guy wasn't fighting; he wasn't resisting arrest. We've seen people had their hands on the wheel, hands out the window, still got shot. I don't know what to tell my kids to make them safe. I know. I don't know what to tell my kids, my sons or my daughters, to ensure that they are safe. Yeah. And what we need, these, these fraternities of silence to the police officers that are sitting out there and you are good and you love Jesus and you're, you're kind people. When you see a brother in blue doing wrong, you cannot allow your fraternity to the other police officer to be stronger than your commitment to God. Mm. You, cannot, you cannot pledge such an allegiance to him that you betray God to protect him. Hmm. That's what we want. That's what we want. That's all. That's all we want. That's all anybody wants. We want what you want. It's not a mystery. We 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 want to grow old. Hmm. We we want to live. We want a, a chance at opportunities. We want better education. We, we want access to lending practices. We want that when a PPP comes through and a CARES Act comes down, we want the bank to treat us like they treat you and to give equal access to opportunities. We, we want that. We just want to live. And, and as much as, as you can do to do that, and as much as you can do to hold elected officials accountable and district attorneys accountable mm -hmm. and, and, and neighbors accountable, and as much as you can not be like the first two people in the Good Samaritan who came and looked and watched it on the news and turned your head and walked away and said, that's not on my radar, as much as you can do that, you ought to be the third guy in the story who gets down off of your beast and comes where the victim is, whoever the victim is, whatever the color is, and pours in oil and wine. And let me say this. There are some people that, that, that are black that get arrested that absolutely should be arrested. They did a crime or they're belligerent or they're out of control or they broke out a window or they were beating their wife or they were abusive or something. And we are not asking not to be arrested. We are just asking not to be tried on the sidewalk. That's all. Just, just don't arrest me, try me, convict me, and kill me on the sidewalk. While you take the other victim who killed eight people in a church. You gave McDonald's. And you take them out to get something to eat. Mm -hmm. As far as I can tell, George Floyd did not get anything from Burger King. And he didn't kill anybody. And you can't say you can't see that. You can't be that blind that you don't see that. And I, and I challenge us today 
to work on just being better people. And 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 if you have anything in your heart, if somebody hurt you when you were a kid or they beat you up every day, I understand it and I get it. Yeah. But if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, and you got to get that out of your heart. Have to. You got to. You got to get that out of your heart. Have to. So that you can be free, and so that you can be whole. Because the only thing worse, the only thing more condemning and more captive than being the victim, is being the perpetrator. Mm. Because you have to be. It must be miserable to hate somebody so bad must be. that you could put your knee in their neck and crush them dead and brought open daylight. And and everybody stand around and watch it and then go have some coffee and donuts. I don't know whether to feel sorry for him or for the for the police that did it and the ones who watched it. And none of them, not one of them said, hey man, oh, hold up. You're going too far. Hey, hey, he's handcuffed. He's down, man down. I shouldn't have to have on blue for you to scream man down. That man is just down. Okay, and the and the charge that they thought he committed was forgery. They weren't sure. They, they thought he committed forgery. You don't break somebody's neck for a bad check. No. And and if I go out here and I go in the Target and I pick up a pair of underwear, I get arrested. That's the truth, man, my friend. Yeah, I, I am equal parts in pain, equal parts encouraged because we, we will win this because only Jesus can do that. Only only Jesus. We we've seen racial behavior modification. That's when you find out being a racist will cost you money and cost you a job and cost you a circle. That's racial behavior modification, but you're still racist. What we're talking about is only what Jesus can do. That's when he breaks your heart, changes your mind, and gives you brand new eyes. That's what's going to happen today, and that's what I'm going to keep on. The only bit of peace and solace we can find is trusting that the same Jesus that changed my heart, my life. That's our only hope. Because behavior, racial behavior modification is not doing it. We've been there. And I believe that as, a, as I listen to you talk, I almost don't know what to say. I don't have anything to say other than my hope is in Jesus. You know, there are a couple words right now that religious white people are, are, are making antagonistic and they're not. It's because people are getting taught wrong. So when I use the word white privilege, um, you can write it off, you know, if it's coming from one angle. Um, but I, I've often explained to people white privilege, it doesn't mean that you need to apologize. It doesn't mean that you don't work hard. It doesn't mean that you're racist. It's just an acknowledgement that our world is uneven. And I started at a place you did not. Dexter did not. Facts, no. Roman, Dexter, your son, they started on a different premise. Does that mean that I am a bad man, a bad white man? Does that mean that I didn't work hard? Does that mean my dad, Steve Lentz, he didn't hang sheetrock and be a park ranger and he was a pastor and he did prison ministry just to provide for me and my sisters growing up? Does it mean my dad worked less hard? No, it just means we live in a country that's unequal. And I've been saying it. Our church is tired of me saying it. But can you just talk to this person that's watching right now that just is this close to getting free from some bondage, almost antagonistic thinking where it doesn't need to be because you've been taught wrong. Somebody said, hey, watch out for some black people. We're going to try to tell you that you got privilege. You don't have privilege. That's what people say when. That's what we're going to destroy. So what would you say to somebody who is genuinely trying to hear it out and they've heard all the wrong stuff? What do you say to a, a white person who's trying to hear today? If if, if you don't have white privilege, I don't have pastor's privilege. I, when I walk in my church, they respond to me differently than they would if a stranger walked in my church. Privilege comes with positions and you have to be intentional about making sure. I tell them, make sure you offer everybody some coffee. <laughs> you know, he might want some coffee too. It's easy by virtue of your position 
to experience privilege. And sometimes it's not even coming out of you. It's coming out of how other people treat you. Their perception of you automatically is a privilege. And the onus is on the privileged to reach to the other person and say, he may want some coffee. <laughs> That's know? the problem because and, people don't think they're privileged. Yeah, That's they don't the problem. Think, you know why? Because you've always had it. So you don't notice it. <laughs> My kids, people people say to me all the time, I wish you were my father. Oh my God, if you were my father, it would be amazing. I'd keep you up all night talking to you. My kids don't keep me up all night talking to me. They don't pay me no attention at all. <laughs> you know why? I'm all they've ever known. Wow. I'm all they've ever known. So they have nothing to compare it to. That is their norm. Okay? That is absolutely their norm. And when it is your norm, you need to believe other people when they tell you that this exists and work to change it. And let me reverse it. If I take you over in the hood and we start going in the hood in the middle of the night, I will have privileges over there that you won't have. Correct. And you'll, you'll only be protected because you're with me. Correct. And you'll be at the mercy of my love to protect you. Everybody can have privilege when they have a sociological construct that is designed for them. And, and there's a certain amount of bias that is in an eight in human beings by nature, and that's okay until it comes to whether I get a loan or not, or whether I can buy a house or not, or whether I'm hired for a job or not. Everybody has sociological constructs that curve around them. Mm. Not just white folks. Mm. Every people group has that. And if you come out of your bubble, you'll experience it in reverse. Mm. So the person who brings you into that other environment, the onus is on them to make sure that the floor is leveled enough that you are comfortable. Because I'm not a visitor. This is my home. This is my country. And we fought in every war. And we died in every war, even though we were slaves. Even we fought for freedoms that we came home to and couldn't enjoy. We died on the battlefield for a country that when we got home, we couldn't even eat in the restaurant. Most of my uncles were soldiers. In the Korean War, in World War II, they fought in the battlefields and came home and dodged trouble from the Klan. That's the truth. And this, my hope is for this generation. My hope is for you. My hope is for you. My hope is for this generation. My hope is for people like you. Be because you you were raised in an environment and exposed to things that enabled you to think differently. Yeah. Sometimes you think like where you came from, and that's that happens to all people. Yeah. But but it's so important that this be the chosen generation that makes a difference. I brought you and and mostly white guys and stuff into our home and slept in our beds. Mm -hmm. And we fed you till I was trying to make you big as me. Swam in you your know? pool. Swam in my pool. Had a great, had a great time. We didn't have a black time or a white time. We had a great time. We just time. had a great time. <laughs> we just had a great time. That's what that's what the world ought to be like. And that's probably what what the people in your church feel like. But we have to make sure that the people outside of the comfort of your church have those opportunities too. I'll tell you this one quick story and I'll go. I went to Coretta Scott King's funeral mm. and uh, and we were lined up and it was cold and we were outside and it was acres of people. And we were waiting to go in and I looked out of the corner of my eye and I saw Joel Osteen. Mm. And when I saw Joel Osteen, I almost wept because Joel Osteen pastors a lot of black people. Hmm. And if you're going to pastor us, you have to weep when we weep. Mm -hmm. Because we respect our pastors. 
Yeah. And we will fight for our pastors. That's right. We will attack you for our pastor. And we want our pastor to fight for us. And when our community's in trouble, if you're our pastor and you're our shepherd, show up because we take heat to come to your church. Mm. Like you take heat to speak out. And the fact that he would come into that environment and stand out in the cold and come in that building, my respect for him just leaped up through the roof mm. because he understood that with leadership comes a responsibility. And to the people that don't understand why you care, maybe they won't ever understand. That's okay. Mm -hmm. But God made you the shepherd of a diverse congregation and you have to care. And you have to care about undocumented workers and you have to care about people uh, who are Spanish speaking people and the woes and the ills of that community. And God only put you there because your heart was big enough to embrace diverse bodies of people. And so, so we, we thank God for that. We, we appreciate that. We sing in our churches, we used to sing a song to be like Jesus. Hmm. Oh, how I long to be like him. He was so meek and lowly. He was humble and holy. Oh, how I long to be like him. And that ought to be the cry of every Christian. And if we are to be like Jesus, we will sit by the well and wait on a Samaritan woman who believes in another God and we'll sit and talk to somebody that we're not supposed to talk to and we'll cross the line and we will redefine who is my neighbor. Will you pray for us? And before you do, I can, I, can, I, can I tell you, uh, I, I appreciate you. I honor you. I respect you. I'm grateful for you. We don't take you for granted. You've been through a lot. You've pioneered a lot of trails. You've been standing in the fire a long time. And we won't waste the ground that's been taken. And I know it looks dark, but I need you to hear it. Until you feel how I feel when I put my son down, till you feel like that about your boys, we're going yeah. to stay at this post. Good, good. Let me say this to, to, to all of the people that are listening. I've, I've done maybe nine or 10 films in my life. And when I did my first film, I put everything I had into it and we were, it was a limited release and, and we did okay for a limited release, but it wasn't astronomical or anything like that. And a friend of mine did his film and it was a blockbuster and everybody was talking about it. And I noticed that when they started talking about his film, I felt funny. I just felt just a little funny. One day I was driving home and I said to myself, why do you feel funny every time they bring that up? That's weird. And I said, I think you're jealous. And I thought, oh God, I don't want to be jealous. So I, th I determined in my heart that I wasn't going to allow jealousy to live in my heart. So I bought all the theaters out for his film that I could afford. And I brought all kinds of people down there to go see his movie. And I, I published it, I promoted it, I pushed it, I publicized it. You know why? I wanted to abort jealousy out of my heart. And to those of you, it might be anger at your husband. It might be unforgiveness with your child. It may not have anything to do with race at all. It may be your mother you're not speaking to. But if you sense that there's a crevice of something that's in your heart. It is up to you to abort that thing before it takes any root and gives birth in your behavior. And when I pray for you today, I pray that you would release whatever that little bitty thing. Mm. It's not just black and white folks. Black folks can be prejudiced too. Brown folks can be prejudiced. If you got a thing in you right now that you feel a little bit funny when you get around certain kind of people, that you feel a little bit uneasy, be honest with yourself. The Bible says if you judge yourself, you have no need to be judged. If you feel funny, odd, peculiar, uncomfortable, you have to work, resist it by going hard the other way to let the enemy know that you can have no place in my heart. I wanna pray for you today 
that you would get a release in your spirit and that you would not only get it out of your heart, but that you would break your silence wherever you see it and you would hold the people with whom you have influence accountable that we could live up to our American ideals and our Christian ideals of a better world. Let us pray. God is, is with bowed heads and humble hearts that, that we approach your throne for all of us are but filthy rags before you. And we're so flawed and so imperfect and I don't know why you put such treasure in such trash, but you did. And we admit that there are areas in our lives that need reconstruction. It might be in our marriage, it might be with our children, it might be with our race, it might be denominational issues, whatever, whatever it is, we will not lie about it. And we will not allow it to grow unchallenged in our hearts. We confess our sins. Please forgive us. If we have ever looked at somebody else's pain and crossed the street and walked away and turned our heads, please forgive our silence. If we have been indifferent to anybody suffering, whether it was a woman or a child or a black person or a white person or a brown person, Please forgive us. Let us learn from the Good Samaritan that we are all neighbors, stewards of your planet, recipients of your grace, receptors of your love, benefactors of your mercy. Now, Holy Spirit, come in and fill that empty space because your word says that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Let that love come in and fill that space. And the last thing I would ask you for is to give us the courage to break our silence against injustice and to go against the crowd mm. and withstand the status quo and to have the courage to be a grown man and a grown woman for God. In the mighty name, the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. I love you. I love you too. On behalf of my church, um, we appreciate you. Potter's House NYC until you really do it. Okay? Give us a heads up. All right. Hand me over sometime. You owe me dinner. I do. I All love right. you. I'm going to eat you out of house home. Come on. I'm ready. <laughs> Take care, buddy. I love you. Bye-bye.